Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Mark Thomas, right? Uh, can you hear me all, everybody? I would like to introduce Mark. Uh, Mark uh, joined uh, the Apache Tomcat Tom community in 2003, and since 2008 has been employed by SpringShares, now part of Pivotal, to work uh, on Apache Tomcat. He spends most of his time on Tomcat, uh, and his, uh, car the, f the current focus of his work is Tomcat 8, which supports the latest versions of servlet, JSP, and EL specifications. Uh, he's a member of the JACP expert groups in servlet, EL, and WebSocket. Uh, he's uh, an ASF security team member and member of the ASF uh, infrastructure uh, team. Uh, he's a member of the Apache Software Foundation. And uh, uh, with uh, without further ado, please. Uh, Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Mark. Sorry. <laughs> so that's fine. Okay, right. Um, so, this is the first of three talks I've got today, and what I'm going to be doing is talking about um, SSL. So, I'll, I'll skip over the introductions fairly quickly because I think we've just covered most of that. What I want to do today is really cover some very basics of cryptography, um, then explain how those go to, how those are used in SSL, and then demonstrate actually configuring Tomcat uh, for SSL. So I'll cover both the um, BIO and NIO connectors a little bit on APR native, although I won't actually demo that, and I'll talk about reverse proxies as well. So introductions, I think we've pretty much uh, covered all of this, so let's skip through that. We've got a lot to talk about. The reason I wanted to give this presentation is we get an awful lot of questions on the Tomcat mailing list about Essentially, the thing is, I can't set up my SSL, or I've, I've imported my certificate and it's not working. And it's clear from the questions that the people asking them don't understand how SSL works. And trying to debug something you don't understand is a heck of a lot more difficult than trying to debug something you do understand. So the idea of this presentation is to turn SSL from this black box where magic happens to a box where you understand what's going on and the error messages make a little bit more sense, and you understand why you're doing the steps you're doing, and hopefully uh, configuring SSL will get that a little bit easier. So let's do some cryptography basics. And it's at this point that I realize that the conversion to PDF has gone really badly wrong. Okay, let's see how well this goes. We might need to have a, a brief pause while I switch to a VM and hope that um, I can get PowerPoint up. Uh, let's have a look at some of the other. Yeah, no, that's just not going to work. Right, OK. Talk amongst yourselves for a minute. Right, OK. Oh, I love this. Right. OK, right. Let me, um, right, we're going to be talking about hash functions in a minute. So I'll see if I'll do that, talk about that without the slides and see where we end up. Come on. So a hash function is essentially, it's a way of taking a fingerprint of a piece of data. It's essentially a one-way function. You can take the data, hash it, generate the fingerprint. What should, if the, if the hash function is secure, be very difficult to do, is take the fingerprint and work out what the data was. In fact, it should be impossible to take the fingerprint and work out what the data was. So it's a, a one-way fingerprint generation. So you start with your plain text, you take the hash, you get the fingerprint. Um, Meanwhile, Windows has almost finished booting up. <sighs> OK, right. Um, so that's hash functions. The next thing we need to understand is uh, symmetric encryption. And here you have a piece of plain text. You take an encryption algorithm, which has a an encryption key. You take that key, and you encrypt the plain text, and that gives you the ciphertext. So say I wanted to. Um, send that encrypted information to Chris. For Chris to, to take that, he receives the ciphertext. In order to take that ciphertext and turn it back to the plain text, what he needs is the encryption key. And he needs the same encryption key that I used to encrypt it. And the problem we now have is if, if we're in the same room, this is easy. I can give it to you on a USB stick. I can write it down on a piece of paper. whatever. If we're on the opposite sides of the world, that's a, bit, a little bit more difficult, because I need to get the encryption key to him securely without anybody else being able to read it. Well, that's all right. I could encrypt it. But hang on a minute. I need to, to do an encryption key to do that. So you, you end up trying to work out, well, there's no way for us to securely transfer that information without usually meeting face to face. 
So that, that's sort of the, the drawback of symmetric encryption is how do you do the key distribution and how do you do that securely? It normally means having to do it via a, a different channel. So, and th th there are ways around that, but they tend to involve um, procedure and process and stuff, right? Making progress with this. Now, hopefully, oops, wrong one, it's shared. Oh, that's just not. There we go, right. Do, 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 repos, uh, it's not net. Documents, presentations. SSL this time with diagrams with any luck. Right. Uh, da, 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 da. Slideshow. Where's the, no, there's a, right. Da, da, da. Ah, pictures, lovely, right. <laughs> um, so, symmetric encryption, plain text, take the key, gives you, that obviously there's, there's an encryption algorithm that's going on here as well, ciphertext, ciphertext plus the key, and a decryption algorithm, which is obviously quite closely related to the encryption algorithm, you get the plain text. The important bit here is the key is the same. Okay, uh, done hash functions, right, asymmetric encryption. This is where it gets a little bit more interesting. Here you have a pair of keys. For now, I'm just going to call them A and B. If I use key A to encrypt something, you have to use key B to decrypt it. I can't, I can't, even if, I, if I've encrypted it with key A, key A will not decrypt it. I have to use key B. If I use key B to encrypt it, I can only decrypt it with key A. So whichever key I use to encrypt it with, I have to decrypt it with the other key. And it's mathematically extremely difficult, again, if everybody's done everything properly, to work, to, if I've got key A, to work out what key B is. There is a mathematical relationship between the two. Um, if you've got enough computing power and enough time, you can work, it, work one out from the other. But the idea is that it's sufficiently complex that you can't do that. Um, and hopefully sufficiently complex that nation states don't have the computing power to do it either. Unless, of course, they've nobbled the algorithms in the first place, but that's a whole different talk for probably for a different conference. Um, so what we actually do is we call one of these keys the public key and one of these keys the private key. It actually doesn't matter which, whether we call A or B the public key, um, but one of them's the public key and one of them's the private key. And the public key, as its name suggests, I make available to everybody. It's published on the internet, it's freely available, anybody can have access to it. The private key I look after very, very carefully. And that's the thing that's on the removable media, in the lock safe, in the concrete block, buried at the bottom of my garden kind of um, security. That's the key that you've really got to look after. So, I said we had to use the different keys to encrypt and decrypt. So if we take our plain text and encrypt it with the public key to get our cipher text, then to decrypt it, we've got to use the private key. So, th let's, let's take some of those concepts, combine them together, and create what are known as digital signatures. And I will, I will add at this point, I am not a cryptographer, I am not a mathematician, I am an engineer. So some of what I say might not be exactly correct in terms of terminology, but the, what I want to do is give you enough working knowledge to be able to figure out what's going on with SSL. That's kind of what I'm aiming at here. So digital signatures. We start off with a plain text, and we generate our hash, we generate our fingerprint, and then we take that fingerprint and our private key, and we encrypt the fingerprint of the private key, and that gives us our digital signature of this plain text. Well, how's that useful, you ask? Well, it means you can now validate it, because if, say, again, I send that signed document to Chris, if Chris takes the digital signature and my public key, which is freely available, he can decrypt that digital signature, and he'll get a hash, he'll get the fingerprint back out. If he then takes the original document, and uses the same hashing algorithm, he should get the same hash. And if he does get the same hash, then you can then make a series of deductions that go along the lines of, well, if Chris got the same hash, then the, ha the digital signature must have been encrypted because it was decrypted with my public key. It must have been encrypted with my private key. Assuming that only I have access to my private key, this document must have come from me. I'm the only person that could have signed it. And equally, I can't deny signing it unless I've lost my private key. Um, so you get that assurance that yes, this really did come from me, assuming that I've looked after my private key properly. So yeah, that, just to recap, 
public key decrypted the digital, digital, digital signature, therefore the associated, associated private key must have created it, therefore you know that the document came from the person who had access to the private key. The next problem is working out, well, okay, how do I know who, and how do I really know who the owner of those public and private keys are? Because anybody can put a private key, public key on the internet and says this is the public key for Mark T at Apache.org. I mean, yeah, I've done it, but there's nothing stopping anybody else in this room doing it as well. So how do you know that that's really my public key and nobody else's? And determining who the owner of those public-private key pairs are is sort of the next problem. And I'm going to look at this more from an SSL perspective than I am from a digital signature web of trust kind of perspective. So how do you know that it's really mine? This is where certificates come in. So now what we do is we take what I claim to be my public key and we take my identity information. That might be an email address, it might be a domain name, it could be a photograph, it could be anything. But in if we're thinking of SSL, then really it's the um, fully qualified domain name of the server. So you know, www.apache.org, for example. That's the identity information that we're interested in. So we take the public key and we take the identity information. We hash it, so that gives us our fingerprint. We get somebody else called a certificate authority to sign it with their private key, and that creates a digi digital signature. We then take our public key, our ID, and the signature, combine them together, and that's our certificate. But those of you that have been paying close attention will have spotted a little wrinkle in this exercise. In order to validate the certificate authority's signature, you need to be able to link their public key to their identity. Well, that's all right. We can do that with a certificate. and We've just seen how to do it. So we basically do the same process again, but then our identity in the first box is the certificate authority's identity. That's OK. So we've then got this train of, chain of trust. Um, at the top of that train, chain of trust is what's known as a root certificate from the root certificate authority. And there are multiples of these. Um, in the SSL talk yesterday, most browsers trust about 150 of these by default. So there are multiple of these root certificate authorities. And these are self-signed. They are self-certifying, saying we are who we say we are. You know, VeriSign's root certificate authority claims to be VeriSign. And really, in, you either trust your, op your operating system that the certi root certificates that are installed on your operating system are correct, or if you're paranoid, you'll go out to those organizations and validate the information that they've published elsewhere to confirm that the certificates are valid. But you end up with this certificate chain. It's, you've got your certificate that will be signed by a certificate authority that itself is signed by another certificate authority that ultimately is signed by a root certificate authority. And that's, that certificate is self-signed. When you um, knock up a little quick SSL test and you generate a self-signed certificate, really, you're just doing this bit. You're, not, you're ignoring the rest, and you're just doing that when you generate a self-signed certificate, which then, of course, you have to explicitly say you want to trust it. So how does this all work with SSL? Um, well, SSL connections are initiated by a handshake, and this handshake has some mandatory steps and some optional steps, and we're going to work our way through the common case. But up to this point, what you've hopefully got now is an idea of what's happening when you generate your key locally, send your, send your signing request off to the certificate authority and get your certificate back, all the, how all the various bits work together. But let's go through this in a little bit more detail. So our starting point is we've got our client on this side and our server on that side. So our client has a list of certificate authorities that they trust, and it has a list of SSL algorithms that it supports. Our server has got its private key, it's got its certificate, which is its public key and its identity information, which is the domain name, and it's got its own list of supported algorithms. So the first thing is that the client will generate a random number, send a message to the server saying, here's my random number and here's the list of algorithms I support. The server says, that's interesting, I'm going to generate a random number as well, here it is, and here's the list of algorithms, having considered what you support and what I support, this is the list of algorithms that we've agreed, and this is the one I've selected. So this is the algorithm we're going to use from the, for SSL. So we've got both sides now. We've got both random numbers and the selected algorithm. 
Then the server sends its certificate to the client and the client validates it by checking that chain of trusted authorities goes back to a root certificate that the client trusts. And if it doesn't, things fall over at this point. Okay. So now we start doing some interesting things. The client generates something called the pre-mast secret and it encrypts it with the server's public key, which it's validated, and it sends that encrypted message to the server. Because the server's got the private key, it can decrypt it. So now we've got the master secret on both sides. So we've got the pre-master secret on both sides of um, this, this handshake. And the client takes the pre-master secret, its random number, the server's random number, sorry, its pre-master secret, the two random numbers, and generates the master secret. And this is the key that's now going to be used for symmetric encryption from this point onwards. I'll come on to why symmetric in a second. So the, the client's done its bit now. It's ready to talk encrypted data. The server, it's, already, it's got the two ra um, random numbers. It takes the, the pre-master secret. It decrypts it, takes the two random numbers and the pre-master secret, generates the master secret. And now we've got an agreed algorithm on both sides. We've got an agreed secret on both sides. And at this point, we can start encrypted communications. And the reason we use symmetric encryption is it's faster than asymmetric, basically. Uh, mathematically, it's less complex. It's easier to do. It's quicker. So you use asymmetric encryption at the beginning to set the handshake up and to exchange the secret. And from then that point on, you're doing symmetric encryption with the secret that you've agreed. Now, there are various extensions, if I could actually spell the word, um, to this process. Uh, first of all, you can add client certificate authentication to this. This is essentially the, the same process we saw with the certificate, the, the server sending its certificate down and the client validating it. The client will send a certificate to the server and the server will validate it in exactly the same way. Um, a more interesting one is something called server name indication. All of this handshaking happens before a single byte of HTTP gets anywhere near the wire. And the problem, uh, it was all fine and dandy while we only had HTTP 1.0. And then somebody very inconveniently created HTTP 1.1 with something called virtual hosting. So a server can support multiple different domain names. And the way it knows which one a client wants to talk to is it looks at the host header in the HTTP message. That's great. The problem is with SSL. Because with SSL, the client connects to the server and needs to get the certificate back. But all of this happens before we have any HTTP messages going back and forth. So the server doesn't know which of its many virtual hosts the client wants to connect to. So it doesn't know which certificate to send to the client. Um, so in server name indication, what we add to the handshake is the client saying, oh, by the way, this is the host that I ultimately want to connect to. So that way the server is able to say, okay, well, in which case, that certificate I need to send to you for you to validate. Um, another aspect is renegotiation. You, you can reach a point, and it, it kind of depends on your level of paranoia, that you don't want to do too much encryption for too long with the one master secret. You want to change it at some point. Or potentially, you might say, actually, I'm going to do something more sensitive now, so I want to use a stronger encryption algorithm. So there is the ability within the protocol to renegotiate that handshake and change encryption algorithms, generate a new encryption key, those sorts of things. That was actually the source of um, a couple of SSL vulnerabilities that they've, they've since been fixed. There is a, an ongoing issue where triggering those renegotiations actually generates quite a lot of work for the server compared to the amount of work the client has to do. And that can be viewed as a form of denial of service. Um, generally, the Tomcat community doesn't view it that way simply because it, it actually generates no more traffic than if you just create lots of new connections to an SSL server. So, yeah. Um, there, there, are, there are lots of ways to DOS a server, and in the grand scheme of things, that's not something we worry too much about. There's sort of an open question to the users saying, well, we could do something about these renegotiations if anybody was really worried, and nobody was, so that kind of fell to the bottom of the list of things that I was going to implement. Okay, so um, before I go on to demonstrate this in Tomcat, what I just want to do is talk through how all that then applies when you're doing this um, sort of for real, as it were. So um, what we need 
is you need a public-private key pair. You need to generate that. You need a certificate. That will obviously have the public key and the identity in it. You need a certificate authority to um, generate that certificate. And then you need certificates for all of the intermediate authorities that are in the trust chain as well. Tomcat will let you use these certificates and these private keys in a couple of different formats. You can use the Java key store. Um, you can put keys and certificates in it. It's only used by Java. It's a very Java-specific thing. It's generally easier to put information into a key store than it is to drag it out of it. Um, OpenSSL doesn't understand Java key stores. Uh, it has got easier to get the information out of a key store. It used to be that you, know, you need to, needed to sacrifice a goat at midnight and find the one piece of code that was hidden on the internet that somebody's already written to extract the private key out of a Java key store, and it was a complete nightmare. Um, that's got better, but it's still a bit of a pain. An alternative format that I think is supported from, it's certainly supported in Java 7, and I th think it's supported in Java 6, but given that Java 6 is no longer supported, I'm sure nobody in this room is still using it. <coughs> yeah, right. Um, and that's the PKCS 12 format. And that is a format that Java understands and OpenSSL understands. And generally, my recommendation is just use this format. It makes your life so much easier. Um, if somebody, you know, a few months down the line saying, actually, might, for whatever reason, we want to front this with HTTPD or NGINX or something, then it's very easy just to take the certificates and apply them to HTTPD instead. If you put them into a Java key store, it's, it's time to um, start Googling, trying to find the code to extract it, extract it again. So generally, I would say stick with the PKCS12. It's just much, much easier. The certificates themselves come in a couple of different formats. Um, there's the binary format or the ASCII format. OpenSSL, OpenSSL understands both. Um, doesn't really matter one way or the other, to be honest. Um, so uh, yeah, I think I might need to update my version of OpenSSL. <coughs> For those of you that haven't been following, prior to 101G, there's a really nasty bug in OpenSSL that exposes all sorts of sensitive information. You definitely need to upgrade if you're not using it. <laughs> but what I'm going to use in this demonstration is uh, Tomcat 8, and it's whatever the latest source is at the minute. Um, you know, David did his demo um, installing from binary. I'm going to build from source, uh, just to go that one bit further. Uh, and just to demonstrate that actually building Tomcat is a complete doddle. It's really not, not hard at all. Um, we've got OpenSSL installed locally. Uh, this is all on OSX. The OpenSSL stuff works exactly the same way on just about every other platform. The only thing you need to worry about is changing the path to make sure they're, they're the right path for your platform. So, right, what I'm going to do now is switch to a console window. Come on, there we go. Okay, right, that should be big enough for folks to read. So what I'm going to do is make sure I'm in my home directory and make a directory called demo and go into demo. Okay, then I'm just going to create some more directories that I'm going to be working with. So I've got a directory for certificates. Certs is sort of one that's used internally by the certificate authority. I'm going to create new certs is where the, um, the actual certificates we're going to send out to the clients are. Private is where the, all the private information is basically where the private keys are going to end up. And requests are where I'm going to put the certificate signing requests. Certificates need serial numbers, so let's just uh, create a file, track serial numbers. And when we create a, um, a certificate authority with OpenSSL, then it needs a, um, a file just to track what's going on, so we'll use index text for that. Next, I'm going to take the local OpenSSL config and copy that locally because I want to tweak it ever so slightly. All with me so far. Should be fairly basic stuff. Right, okay, next page. Right, time to go and play with thy. So what we're looking for is the directory where stuff is happening. Yeah, I just want that to be the uh, current directory, please. And default bits. I'm kind of surprised this is still 1024. Um, I'm going to set it to 2048. You might even want to go all the way to 4096 now. Um, 2048 is meant to be OK for a, a reasonable period of time. But again, it depends. 
The more bits you have, then the more complex the maths is when you're doing the handshaking. So the greater load on the server, the sl slightly slower it will be, but the more security you get. So, you know, pays your money, takes your choice. I think it's a decision you need to take based on sort of the threat for your particular environment. Right. Oops, that's not what we wanted to do. Um, fix that before we cause all sorts of problems. And, yeah, uh, is that Austria or Australia? But whatever it is, it's not where we are. <laughs> right. And those are the changes I wanted to make to that. Okay. You will notice I've got a crib sheet here. Obviously, all of the, all of the stuff that's in the crib sheet is just on the slides that I'm, I'm not showing at the minute. Uh, so it's, there's, there's no way I'm going to remember this. Right, so first thing we need to do is we need to, cr we need to um, create ourselves a root certificate authority. Now, normally, you wouldn't need to do this. Normally, you'd use VeriSign or somebody, like, somebody else like that. But for the purposes of this demo, I need a proper certificate authority. I don't want to pay um, to... to um, get a certificate signed, and I don't really want to start using things like Apache's wildcard cert, because I'd get into trouble if I started copying that around too much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create my own local certificate authority. So X509. We want this certificate authority to, well, to be honest, if it's valid for the next hour, we'll be fine, but we'll do it for 10 years. Why not? Um, we want to be using, whoops. Version 3, we're a certificate authority. Right, our key wants to go into private. And this is obviously, if you were really a certificate authority, this is one of the things that you want to really, 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 really look after. Um, this is just a demo, so it's, it can sit on my um, local drive, and that's fine. That's where we're going to generate the certificate. We'll pop it in the pen format. And our config, we want to make sure that we use the OpenSSL. And hopefully, if I haven't made any typos, that will just work. It's going to take a little bit of time because it's um, generating the random numbers for the keys in the background. Or I've got something wrong and it's going to go horribly wrong. That looks... Uh, I know what I've forgotten. <laughs> oh, this is why we have crib sheets. bit we forgot is... All the way back here. Try that. That's better, right. Um, whenever I need a passphrase in this demonstration, I'm going to use change it. Uh, primarily because that's the, the default one that Tomcat uses, because it's the default one that Java uses. Right, we now need to check, we're being asked for the information to go into this uh, certificate authority. So yeah, we're in the US, uh, Colorado, Denver. Org name is Apache Con. Organizational unit, we're not going to have one. Right, uh, this is the Apache Con Demo Root CA. Uh, email address, don't care. Right, done. I've just created myself a certificate authority. Now I can charge you all a thousand bucks a time to generate certificates. Brilliant. Um, so now let's get on to the bit that you need to worry about when you're doing this with your servers. So the first thing you need to do is you need that public private key pair. And you need to um, take the identity information and the public key and send that off to a certificate authority. And that public informa identity information, sorry, the public key and the identity information wrapped up that you send to a certificate authority is known as a certificate signing request. So that's usually the first thing that you generate. So we want to generate ourselves a signing request. So it's a request. It's new. We want... X509, uh, no, wrong, S reading the wrong line. Go back, minus nodes, that's better. Now, our, our signing request is going to go into the requests directory that we created earlier, and we're going to call this localhost request.pem. I do wish this wouldn't rock, so I uh, put my foot on it. Maybe that'll stop it. Um, okay, local request. Our private key, we obviously don't want to send off to anybody. We need to keep that private. So that's going to go in private. And we'll call that localhost key.pem so we know what we're dealing with there. And again, our config is going to use the local SSL one. I think that's everything. It'll either work or keep right there we go. So now it's yeah, Chris. Chris. 
yeah, yeah, doing it all in one go. Um, you could do it separate steps, but just for, it's, it's quicker doing it this way, so yeah. So we've generated the, well, we've generated the um, private key. That was these, those dots flying along, that's been done. And now we're just being asked the information for the certificate signing request. So country name, you went, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we're still in Colorado, we're still in Denver. Organization name, uh, Apache Con Demo, or just Apache Con, I think we had before. It doesn't matter, it could be anything. Organizational unit name, whatever. This is the important name, the common name. This is the identity that's going to appear in the certificate that needs to match our host name. So I'm going to be very carefully make sure that says localhost. Otherwise, I'm going to get a certificate mismatch error when I try connecting to the server. Obviously, if I was doing this for, an, for say, um, Apache's Jira instance, well, actually, it's not just Jira, it's a few other things. It's all issues.apache.org, so I put issues.apache.org there. If I was doing this for Apache's main web server, it would be www.apache.org. Actually, it wouldn't in any of those cases. We use a wildcard certificate, but that's kind of a, a by the by. It's the server name that has to go there, the email address, whatever. Uh, I don't want a challenge password. I don't want an optional company name. Right, done. Excellent. So that's created that request. Now, normally what you'd do is you'd um, go online, you'd get your credit card out, you'd pay VeriSign, DigiCert, whoever, a large amount of money, and you'd take, the, you'd take that certificate signing request and you'd paste it in their web form. They would do some magic and they'd send you back a certificate. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the magic on the command line instead. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to pay myself a thousand bucks when I do it. Uh, so, right, this certificate, we're going to make it valid for about two years. Config. There's our open SSL config again. Right, now. Is it? Yeah, I, I find that with the, with the um, TCKs. When we do our Tomcat 7 releases, we run it all through the TCKs. Part of that includes SSL stuff. So we've got some various certificates set up to do all that. And every, I think it's every two or three years, it suddenly starts failing, and I can't figure out why. And then I realize, oh, so all the certificates have expired, and off we go. But all of, all of these files are actually in our private repo, so any of the Tomcat committers can go and fix it. But I digress. Right, so yes, our local host certificate is going to go in that directory when it's been created. Um, and the files it's going to be generated from are from the requests, localhost request. There we go. So this is essentially what VeriSign, DigiCert, and everybody else are charging you a thousand bucks for. What, they're really char what they should be charging you for is they are verifying that you own the www.apache.org or whatever domain name you've asked them to sign. That's really what the money should be being spent on. Um, some certificate authorities do a better job than others of that. And there are different um, levels of validation. You can basically pay more money for, for uh, additional checks. It's certainly worth shopping around for SSL certificates. Um, just as a, for instance, Apache has got three wildcard SSL certs. One from VeriSign, which we use for www and issues and all of the top level projects. And if we'd paid for it, it would have cost us six figures because, uh, because of the number of hosts we needed it for. And they charge you sort of a, a per host. Or a, and we basically said, yeah, we want it to be unlimited. And they, they kind of sucked breath for a while, and, but ultimately handed it over. For free, I hasten to add, very generously. Um, for um, OpenOffice, which also needed a, a separate, because we've got OpenOffice.org, we needed a separate wildcard certificate for that. And also we needed a separate one for all the incubator sites because they're star.incubator.apache.org rather than star.apache.org. Um, DigiCert, uh, I think it was 1,500 bucks, three years, wildcard cert, as many hosts as you like. Um, significantly cheaper than VeriSign. So it's always worth shopping around the different providers for the sort of certificate that you want um, and look at the different prices. Um, there are very, very, very big, you know, orders of magnitude difference in terms of what they charge. So it's not, it's not like buying a $20 safe versus a $500 safe? No, no, the, it's, it, it, it's, it's exactly the same. And the, neither, neither of those, are, well, you can't do extended validation on wildcards, I don't believe. So, yeah, they're, they're, the, same, um, they're the same strength, they're the same security. Uh, that they're, they're both trusted CAs. It's just the, the different pricing model that they've, they've taken. Um, 
Although it has to be said, in Verisign's favour, they gave us that certificate for three. DigiCert ummed and ahed for a couple of weeks about giving it, uh, giving it to us for free. They didn't say, stuff it, I'll just spend the money, it's easier. Um, yeah, we need this. We need it now. It's, it's only 1,500 bucks. We've got the money in the bank. Let's do it. So, yeah, pros and cons. Um, and, and Verisign, we're also working with them to do some code signing, but I digress. Anyway, we need to sign this. Right, so remember the password was change it. Right, am I sure I really want to do this? Yes. Am I really sure? Yes. Bingo, we've got our certificate. So then the certificate authority would email that back to you or um, tell, send you an email saying you can now download it from, from this location. Right, so the next thing we need to do is we need to be able to use this with Tomcat. And we need to take those certificates that are in the PEM format and get them into the PKCS12 format. So again, that's an, another OpenSSL command. So let's get everything back to the top of the screen so you can see what's going on. OpenSSL, right, PKCS12. Right, we want to export this. Now, bearing in mind that a PKCS12 file has your private key in it, it needs to be protected just the same way you protect your private keys. Um, certificate files, you can afford to be a little bit more lax about. Private keys, you have to be very, very careful with. Right, so export it, and we want to send it to uh, private localhost.p12. Uh, and this is going to come from Inky, localhost key perm, and the, the cert gets wrapped up in there as well. And uh, file. Did I get that right? Yes, that file, and there's the CA certificate, right. Uh, export, part. again, I'm going to put change in it. One thing I discovered whilst um, working my th way through this presentation, Java doesn't like private keys without passwords. Um, now, I'm not sure whether it's Java doesn't like or Tomcat isn't quite using the API in the right way, so Java does like, but either way, even if it's the weakest password in the world because you're protecting the file physically, and you're protecting the file in terms of OS permissions, life is easier if you just make sure there's a password of some form on it. It doesn't need to be particularly strong, but if there's a password there, it, it saves you some hassles later on. So I'm just going to make sure that, again, it's change it. And make sure I can type it properly. No, I can't. Let's try that again. Did I? There we go. Right, done. Now, um, we want to, want to get this working with Tomcat. So, right. CD, repos, ASF public, Tomcat trunk. Right. No idea what state I've left this, this in, so let's clear all that off. Right. Tomcat is really, really difficult to build. Incredibly difficult. Wait. That's it. Ant. All you have to do, get the source code, type ant. Um, if you want to um, do a full Tomcat release, get the source code, type ant space release. And that will generate exactly the same set of artifacts that we generate when we do releases. Uh, you might want to tweak the build.properties a little bit just to control where it downloads the various third-party dependencies that we build with. But even if you don't do that, it will dump them somewhere vaguely sensible-ish, kind of, on your hard drive. Um, so yeah, my build.properties uh, looks like that. So the base path is just saying right where I want the libraries to download it. And this is all just to do with... Um, Yes, I want you to validate stuff to make sure basically that runs the check style rules. Yes, I want to skip the installer because that requires running a Windows executable and that doesn't work too well on OS X, so I'll skip that. And these are here for when I, by default, the all the tests run. When I want to comment them out, I just say so I can only test on one particular connector. Yeah, fail the test as soon as they fail the build as soon as the tests fail. And when I'm running with APR, there's my local copy of the library. But that's, all of that is just testing stuff to run the unit tests. The bit that really matters is just that line to build it. Put that in a sensible place, job done. But that's built Tomcat. So hopefully if I go to Catalina run, yeah, that looks like Tomcat starting up. And just to confirm that it has actually worked, localhost 8080, excellent. Tomcat's 806 dev. So the good news is my, my most recent commit on Tomcat 8 didn't break the build. Fantastic. To be honest, if, if it had, um, we would have been yelled at by the CI system by now, probably. Um, it takes a, because it, the CI system runs all of the tests as well, so it takes a, lit, a couple of hours to, to yell at us if we get something wrong, but it will, it will yell at us. 
So having got that instance, what I need to do is tell it to use um, these files. So what I want to do is I want to put that um, demo P pkcs12 file, so that's private localhost there, and I'm in there. So the, the standard place to put it is in um, Catalina base conf. And you can put it elsewhere, but generally it makes sense to put it in the conf directory. That, that's certainly where most people would go looking for it if they're trying to find it right. So the next thing we need to do is edit server.xml. And, oh, that works really well on a screen that's zoomed in this far. Yeah, uh, there we go. Right, okay. So lots of connectors. I'm just going to skip past all of that, and I'm going to create one of my own just above the... Um, AJP one, right, okay. So I'm not going to bother indenting it simply because that just takes longer, frankly. Right, um, so port, we're going to put it on 8443, and that's by default where we um, put this on. Right, protocol. This is important. Um, Tomcat has got, well, Tomcat 8 has actually got four con connector implementations now. Blocking I.O., non-blocking I.O., uh, new I.O. 2, and APR native, those are the four. All of them apart from APR are pure Java, therefore they expect Java style configuration. The APR native one is built on top of OpenSSL and it has a completely different set of attributes to configure SSL. You need to make sure you're using the right set of configuration parameters for the version of um, the connector that you're using. The other catch in all of this is that Tom, if the native library is present, Tomcat will auto switch to use it. So what I normally do when I'm doing SSL to make sure I get the connector I want is I explicitly define the protocol rather than using HTTP 1.1 because that will auto switch. In Tomcat 8, if you specify HTTP 1.1, if the native library is not present, you'll get the non-blocking uh, Java-based connector. If the library is present, you'll get the APR native one. So I want to be absolutely sure that I'm getting the non-blocking one. So org Apache Coyote http the scary thing is i can actually do this without looking at the um crib sheet spent far too long doing this sort of thing right that's right isn't it we'll soon find out if it's not sorry uh, okay all right ssl enabled we want we do want ssl to be enabled uh the scheme is https <coughs> Secure is true. Uh, client auth, we'll skip that. Oh, we do want this, though. SSL protocol equals TLS. And this is important. F forget the key store type, and things won't work. So it'll try and use the Java key store by default. OK, CS12. So you need to get that in there. Uh, we need the file. Key store file. And right, that is Catalina.home. I could actually put Catalina Home or base in here because it's the same location on this instance. And localhost. If I get all of this right first time, I'll actually be quite surprised. And the key pass was change it. Right. OK. Right, if I got that right. We can do this. Well, I don't see some good news. I don't see stack traces. That, that's the first positive sign. The next positive sign is that this connector has started. One of the things that I, every time I see this, I keep thinking, yeah, we really should fix that, is we could actually tell, we could actually change that to HTTPS just to make it clear that that's SSL. Or do, although actually there are reasons why you might not want to do that, but we might, it might be worth putting something here just to say, yes, this is running SSL enabled. Um, there are, I'll come on to why changing the scheme might not actually be a sensible thing to do in a minute. But just to confirm that that has in fact worked, if I now go across to my browser and I change to HTTPS, I need to change the port on the end as well. Fine, this is expected because remember we generated our own certificate authority for this, which by default Oddly enough, Apple doesn't trust. So yes, I know what I'm doing. Yes, add the exception. 
don't bother storing it permanently because it's not like that CA is going to last very long. And there we go, we've got SSL. And if we go and look at the key information and view the certificate, we've, there you can see the information that we put in. And that was our certificate request, and that was the CA that we generated, and our validity time, and that all works. So hopefully what you'll be able to do, and this presentation will be available through the conference website. It's available on um, my people.apache.org page. So you've got the recipe here for generating this stuff with Tomcat. So it's something that you can go back to. And it's complete, and it's up to date. All right, what you need to know is go back to the presentation. Right, uh, from the current slide. Right, let's whiz through this because we did all of this. Right. Okay, if I wanted to use BIO, then the main difference here is just the protocol. It's HTTP 11 protocol rather than HTTP 11 NIO protocol. So that's using the blocking IO. If I wanted to use the NIO2, then it's HTTP 11 NIO2 protocol. If I wanted to use APR, it's HTTP 11 APR protocol, and the information for specifying the certificate file, the keys, and everything, that's different. Okay? Here we specify the individual key and the certificate and the CA rather than pointing it at the single PKCS12 file. Right, I'm conscious that I'm run rather tight for time. So uh, we've talked about that. So skip over that one. Right, reverse proxies incredibly quickly. Uh, reverse proxy, some typical configuration, bunch of clients, internet, load balancer, HTTPD, Tomcat. As far as these clients are concerned, they're talking to the load balancer. They've got no idea what's going on behind it. As far as the load balancer is concerned, it's talking to HTTPD. Again, it's got no idea what's going on behind HTTPD. And HTTPD and load balancer are acting as reverse proxies. And essentially, the pattern there is the client thinks they're talking to the reverse proxy. The reverse proxy is actually, unbeknownst to the client, going off elsewhere to gather the information that it's then presenting. This creates a few complications when SSL comes into the picture. So if we've got Tomcat all the way back here, how does Tomcat know whether these clients are connecting to here using HTTP or HTTPS? Now, depending on the type of the load balancer, it might just put the connection straight through, and it's actually HTTPD that's terminating the SSL. But it could be terminated at the load balancer. Either way, I guarantee where it's not terminated is Tomcat. So Tomcat has no visibility, initially, of the um, client uh, connection. So. Things you need to bear in mind when you've got reverse proxies is how's Tomcat going to figure out whether it's HTTP or HTTPS, because that matters for it to get things like marking session cookies as secure right, um, generating redirect URLs correctly. You don't want to read, suddenly redirect from HTTPS to HTTPT. That can cause all sorts of problems. And do you need to encrypt the traffic between Tomcat and the proxy? Um, some organizations, I'm thinking particularly some European banks, have rules that basically say, if there's client data flowing over the network, it must be encrypted. It doesn't matter if it's in the same machine room. doesn't matter if it's even on the same machine. If there's network traffic of any form that's got client data on it, it must be encrypted. Um, so in those cases, they need to encrypt the HTTPD to Tomcat traffic. So why does Tomcat need to know that SSL information? It needs to be able to enforce the transport guarantees that are in, in web.xml. Those basically say, any requests to these URLs must be over SSL. So Tomcat needs to know whether the current request is, and if it's not, it needs to know how to redirect it so it, it is. If a session's created over a secure connection, the cookie's got to be marked as secure, which basically stops the session moving to insecure mode. Redirects and links. And potentially, if you're using certificate-based client authentication, and again, some organizations do, it tends to be more of an intranet thing than an internet thing. But if you're using client certificates, then you need to be able to get the client certificate information to Tomcat as well. So you've got a couple of choices of protocol between Tomcat and the reverse proxy. You can either use AJP or HTTP. Uh, pros and cons. AJP will make sure the, the SSL information gets across, and that happens automatically, but you can't encrypt the connection. With HTTP, the SSL information doesn't tra transition automatically, but if you want to encrypt it, you just proxy over HTTPS instead. So it kind of depends what your requirements are. So if you don't need to encrypt the, traf the traffic, use AJP. If you do need to encrypt, you need to use HTTPS. There are other ways of doing it. You can run AJP over tunnels or IPsec, but generally HTTPS is, gives you more control over exactly what's going on. But if you're using HTTPS, how do you get the SSL information to Tomcat? And you're not interested 
in the SSL information for the HTTPD to Tomcat link. What you want is the SSL information for the client to HTTPD link. So how do you get that across to Tomcat? Very simple. In HTTPD, you say, right, set these request headers. And the important thing here is set, not add. Set ensures that anything that the client sends gets overwritten by these real values. You don't want the client being able to inject their own data here. So you set these request headers, and then in Tomcat, you can, in, under the host, you configure the SSL valve, and what it does is it pulls this information out of the, the HTTP headers, injects it into the right place in the Tomcat internals, so it looks like the client has connected directly. The time is almost over. Yeah, no problem. Um, there is an alternative solution with, um, you create two HTTP connectors in Tomcat. You set the first one, SSL enabled false, scheme HTTP secure false proxy 80. And that, you, you proxy all of your HTTP traffic to this one. This one, you proxy your SSL traffic to. SSL is still disabled, so the actual link isn't going to be encrypted. The scheme, however, is HTTPS which means that when Tomcat generates redirects for requests on this connection, the redirects will be generated with HTTPS at the beginning. It's marked as secure as true, so Tomcat will treat this as secure. Even though it's HTTP, because SSL's not enabled, it will treat requests received over this connection as secure, and the proxy port tells it, when, again, when you generate the redirects, redirect them to 443. So you put all of your first traf HTTP traffic to this one, all of your HTTPS traffic to that one, and make sure you don't get that the wrong way around, otherwise really bad things happen. But this way enables Tomcat to know that, okay, that, I'll treat anything over there as secure, anything over there as insecure, and then you just need to make sure that you proxy the traffic appropriately. So um, we've got about minus seven minutes for questions, um, but we'll fit a couple in. If people do want to get up and go to the next session, feel free to leave. That's not a problem. Any chance of uh, encrypting a key pass, change it in so configuration file? Sorry? Any chance of en encryption of uh, key pass in a configuration uh, file? Waste of time. Um, the question was, what, is there any chance of encrypting the, the password for the key store in the configuration file? Uh, it's a complete waste of time. For the details, look at the um, Tomcat FAQ about encrypting passwords in configuration files. But the short answer is Tomcat has to be able to read that file, in, that information in plain text. So if you encrypt it, then Tomcat still needs to be, to be able to decrypt it, so it needs to get a decryption key somewhere. That's got to be somewhere, so that needs to be, that's got to be in plain text, so it's effectively in plain text anyway. Where there is a valid use case is if you've got a configuration file that you want to have lots of people to have read access to, so you want all the developers to be able to read it, but you don't want them to have the password. The easiest way to handle that is use an XML external entity, put that in a separate file that they can't read, that only root and the Tomcat user can read, and then you just reference it from server.xml that everybody can read. And that way, only Tomcat and root can read the, um, the password. And really, that's, that, that's what you need to lock these configuration files down to, where you've got any passwords you're worried about. Lock it down so it's, it's plain text in a file that only Tom, the Tomcat process and root can read is as secure as you're going to get. Encryption on top of that is pointless. But the FAQ goes into some interesting games you can play if you need to convince the security team that it's more secure. And th there's various tricks you can do. So when doing a demo on a single machine, you keep everything you know, on that machine. However, yep. when deploying a production server outside your you know, firewall, you mm -hmm. normally you wouldn't have the keys to the store there. What don't you want with your Tomcat installation of all the things you generated? Um, what, if I was doing this in production, and I'll sort of take some Apache examples, then the, pr the, the keys that have got, the, the files that have got the private key in, um, the file permissions for those files are set to root only. Well, for HTTPD, it's root only. For Tomcat, it depends how you've got Tomcat configured. You either set it to root only or the Tomcat user only, because root can always read it anyway. But you, you lock those files down so only the user that the Tomcat process runs as can read them. And from that point on, you, you're, you're good enough. Yeah, I, well, the, the private key's kind of got to be there. So and if, if I was running my own CA within an, sort of an intranet, um, it would depend what the sort of organization was um, and why I was doing that. And then depending on my level of paranoia, yeah, I might go as far as having the CA on a completely physically separate machine and floppy disking or USB sticking the, the files between the two. Um, I might move, I'm, even for that machine, I then might move the private key out to a, um, 
hardware key store that's, that's physically protected. It, it all depends on the level of risk and what you're trying to do. I mean, I've seen you know, all ends of that spectrum. Um, from the, yeah, it just sits on that machine over there to the, yeah, it's that building over there with the armed guards and the barbed wire fence. It all depends on what the information is you're protecting and this, the threat assessment that you've done for it. Last question. So my question for uh, the, the distinguished gentleman at the front of the room, as well as uh, the rest of the people in the room, um, what, uh, what vendors have you worked with that are, that are good for HSM that actually just kind of work out of the box and you don't have to do a bunch of uh, crappy uh, things to make hand it Hand on heart, I've never had to do it, so I don't know. Okay. Sorry. Um, but better to say I don't know than to make something up. Sure. Well, I, I know the APR connector can do hardware crypto with uh, the SSL engine implementation yeah. in OpenSSL. And that, that's the way I'd do it. If, if I needed to use a hardware key store, then I'd use the APR native and OpenSSL. Sure. Because to be honest, the vendors of the hardware, key, hardware modules are far more likely to have tested it with OpenSSL and made sure it works with that than they are with Java. So that's, that's the route I'd go. OK, we'll have to call it quits there. Um, I am on later. Uh, some of those other presentations are shorter, so if we've got more time for questions, feel free to throw some SSL ones in as well. Otherwise, thank you very much for your attention.